Please, please, kindly be seated. I, I believe I'm, I'm too young to wear the hat of an old lady. <laughs> I don't have that wisdom of the old ladies. Let me also add my voice in welcoming all of you to this afternoon presser and I will do all I can to be as brief as possible. Beloved guardians, democracy will work only if we fight for it, says President Barack Obama of the United States. I swore an oath to uphold, preserve, protect, and defend the constitution of the Republic of Ghana. And that I will do right to all manner of persons in accordance with the constitution and the laws and conventions of parliament without fear or favor affection or ill will. I concluded the swearing of the oath with a call on God to help me. I'm very confident and have faith in God to see me through these dark days of Ghana and our young democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to start this presser by disabusing and setting the minds of Ghanaians at ease. There is no constitutional crisis in this country. I repeat, there is no constitutional crisis in this country. The Parliament of Ghana is alive and working. Let nobody mislead, misinform, or disinform you and the country. The democratic system we adopted and enacted as captured in the Constitution, 1992, and fleshed out in various laws, processes, procedures, and practices is what has been triggered and it is working. Let us allow it to work. Democracy is about the rule of law. Let the law work. The democratic system we adopted and enacted recognizes that in the course of operationalizing the system, Disagreements will occur and challenges and problems will arise. The system has put in place mechanisms, structures and institutions, processes, procedures and rules to follow and apply to resolve the disagreement, convert the challenges into opportunities and provide solutions to the problems. This is what is being pursued and applied. There is no constitutional crisis in the country. Beloved Ghanaians, I have said Parliament and the people of Ghana continuously for over 32 years as a politician and over 42 years as a public servant. I cherish the role Parliament plays in our democracy. And my mission is to leave Parliament a stronger institution than I met it. 
parliament is alive and working. It has not been dissolved, prorogued, prohibited, suspended, or terminated. The plenary sitting and meetings of parliament were adjourned indefinitely due to lack of quorum to take decisions created by a workout staged by the MPP members who were available as a result of a disagreement. The cause of the disagreement, which led to a disorder, had to be resolved with time and engagement of many more leaders than those in parliament. The adjournment was done by the lawful authority, the Speaker of Parliament. Let us stop pressing the panic buttons and fear mongering and allow the system to work. Anger and indecent language rather inflames the situation. There can be no democracy without patience, tolerance, discipline, collaboration, the love for one another, and consensus building. Ladies and gentlemen, one may ask, what led to this disagreement? Following a statement by Honorable Dr. KCL Atuba Forsen on a matter he considered to be of urgent public importance on the 15th of October, 2024, and comments thereof by other members as permitted by the standing orders of parliament, I communicated the findings of my inquiry into the matter as the Speaker of House on the 17th of October 2024, the contents of which has been construed to be a ruling. The Honorable Alexander Afenio Mark disagreed vehemently with the contents of my communication as the Speaker of Parliament and proceeded to advance an earlier action he had commenced in the Supreme Court on the 15th of October 2024 to prevent the Speaker of Parliament from receiving and making any pronouncement in, on the subject matter of the statement made by Honorable Dr. Kesel Atuba Forsen until the final determination of the matter by the Supreme Court. The rest, we see, is history. Ladies and gentlemen, being a party to the suit in my official capacity, I am mindful of what I say. But it must be said, the suit before the Supreme Court raises not just legal questions, but more importantly, has profound implications for our democratic system of governance. At its core is the very essence of our democracy. While many legal arguments have been advanced in and out of the court, I recognize the fact that connected political and governance implications have not been addressed sufficiently to enrich the national discourse. It is my considered view this should also be vigorously articulated to give a holistic approach to resolving the issue. As one of the protagonists in this matter, and a long time practitioner, it will be a disservice not to respectfully draw your attention to some of the facts, principles, and ethics of politics and governance. The practice and procedures of parliament and what is generally referred to as parliamentary law to throw light on some aspects of the matter and to clarify the considerations that underpinned my actions. 
The current brouhaha may be likened to a power play between the arms of government and has the potential to undermine our democracy and the authority of parliament. Its outcomes could subvert Ghana's institutional order and the democratic system. Ghanaians have toiled, sacrificed their lives, and shed blood to establish for decades. Ladies and gentlemen, recent acts of the judiciary and executive, and I see them as interference in the workings of parliament, pose a direct challenge to the essence, jurisdiction, authority, powers, and functioning of the esteemed institution of parliament, which is the repository of the sovereign will of the people of Ghana. It is increasingly becoming clear the judiciary and the executive are seemingly colluding to weaken parliament. The decision of the Ghanaian voters in the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections is clear and loud to all discerning people. The decision is obviously a preference for a consensual and collaborative governance to a winner-take-all government. The majoritarian system of parliament, where the minority have a say, but the majority have its way, was rejected by the voters. They rather opted for inclusivity, collaboration, consensus building, leaving nobody behind. The equal representation of the two major parties in Ghana, resulting in the composition of a hung parliament to the voters is the better way forward for our dear nation. The expectation of the voters is this will lead to the constitution of a parliament where the national interest will prevail as against partisan or parochial interests. This is the context and the peculiar situation I have to preside over as a speaker. I'm the first speaker in the Fourth Republic, in fact, in the history of Ghana, to work with a president who belongs to a different party. To work without a majority party in parliament but with an evenly divided parliament, 137, 137 apiece. That is a hung parliament. Decision making has therefore not been smooth sailing. As the speaker of parliament, I hold the balance in favor of the national interest. But sometimes, bend backwards to accede to government requests because government has been given the mandate to govern. It is with this understanding I let the board of the parliamentary service and members of parliament to provide procedural rules of engagement to actualize this goal and to provide for the possible types of government as envisaged in the Constitution. These possibilities include an election of an independent president to form a government. Somebody who contests, as we have now, as an independent presidential candidate can be elected by the voters as the president of Ghana. How is he going to work with parliament to get his or her business, that is government business, approved by parliament?
We have a possibility of a minority government where the voters vote for the president, but he has less members of parliament. And that is a minority government. How is he going to get the majority members of parliament to always approve his business for him to govern the nation? We also have a coalition or a major of parties government. And the familiar one we know is the majority government. These are possible governments constitutionally guaranteed in Ghana. In the current hung parliament, the new standing orders of parliament had to cater for such a government by a number of provisions in the standing orders. We also provided provisions for all the other options of government that I just explained. For instance, a day which we called a decision day has been designated in the new standing orders where the speaker in consultation with the leadership of the house will set aside to allow members of parliament who are ministers and deputy ministers the opportunity to be present in parliament to be counted in support of government position to ensure government business does not suffer for lack of government members of parliament in parliament. Despite the above, often the number of government members present still don't add up due to the nature of the duties and responsibilities of ministers and deputy ministers. The NDC members of parliament, however, understood the situation and on a daily basis, cooperated with the MPP members of parliament to see government business through. In spite of this, the NDC members are said to be saboteurs of government business by the MPP members of parliament and the followers of the new patriotic party. Those of you who cover proceedings on daily basis are witnesses to how sometimes I have looked at the members of the NDC in a very stern manner, which made them give in to their objections just to get government business going. Ladies and gentlemen, the powers of the judiciary ends where the nose of parliament starts. The constitution is very clear on freedom of speech and of proceedings of parliament. Articles 115, and one one says, grant members of parliament privileges and immunities of speech, debate, and proceedings on any matter or thing brought by a member in or before parliament by petition, bill, motion, or otherwise. And I want to quote the two articles to you. Article 115, there shall be freedom of speech, debate, and proceedings in parliament. And that freedom shall not be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of parliament. 
Article 1, 1 says, subject to the provisions of this article, but without prejudice to the general effect of Article 115 of this Constitution, civil or criminal proceedings shall not be initiated against a member of parliament in any court or place out of parliament for any matter or thing brought by him in or before parliament by petition, bill, motion, or otherwise. This means happiness in parliament must remain in Parliament. So the court must, and has always been, hesitant to interfere in the proceedings and decisions of Parliament. In the celebrated case of Tufua versus the Attorney General, the Supreme Court affirmed that happiness in Parliament are a closed book. Despite these provisions, the courts are replete with debates and proceedings of parliament. Most worrying is these proceedings are initiated by some members of parliament, even leaders of parliament, who ought to know better. Parliamentarians who are to be loyal to parliament rather than to the Supreme Court, run to the Supreme Court at the slightest opportunity to use the Supreme Court to undermine parliament. This might be one of the reasons parliament and members of parliament are not respected and treated with disdain. This was exhibited by the president's refusal to even receive the LGBTQ plus bill, duly processed and passed by parliament without any legal basis. The judiciary is supported of this conduct by the receipt and processing of a suit on this subject matter. These are dangerous precedents in our democratic journey. Both the president and the judiciary have sinned against the constitution and must seek the opportunity to confess and repent to be forgiven. I am confident the battles we are fighting today will make our democracy stronger and more vibrant in the future. I believe in the supremacy of the Constitution. Mark my words, the supremacy of the Constitution, not the supremacy of the judiciary or Supreme Court. I also believe in a vibrant parliament that is respected and accorded its due on political questions as long established by law and decided cases. A parliament that understands, reflects, and embodies the will of the people and defends its constitutional prerogatives only works in the interest of Ghana and Ghanaians, not a rubber stamp parliament subservient to the whims and caprices of the executive and or the judiciary. Again, I strongly believe that parliament was one of the institutions President Barack Obama had in mind when he opened while in Ghana in 2009 that Africa needs strong institutions and not strong men. I'm happy he didn't add women. <laughs> Parliament must be strong 
to perform its legislative function and the indispensable function of holding the president to account. That is the oversight function. No other person or body has the gravitas and constitutional mandate to do so in Ghana. The public, media, civil society, and other partners in governance can make constructive inputs and criticize actions and omissions of arms of government. But these bodies are not constitutionally and legally structured and mandated to hold the executive to account. Parliament is elected. It is, at its best, the will of the people, legally and constitutionally structured and mandated to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, my dream, therefore, is a patriotic one. The existence of a firm, effective, efficient, and responsive parliament whose members place national and constituency interests ahead of narrow partisan or personal interests. At last, this is yet to materialize in Ghana. Parliament weakens itself when its members keep running to our courts to settle or seek favorable determinations of not just legal matters, but essentially political and governance questions. It is my strong belief the matter before the Supreme Court can be settled within Parliament through matured deliberations and compromises. Please, make no mistake. Not all the strong men President Obama warned us about come in military uniforms. Some come dressed in suits. I hope in my lifetime, Ghana shall have a parliament and a speaker who are truly independent from Jubilee or Flagstaff House or any headquarters in the conduct of parliamentary business. Let me state unequivocally, Parliament owes its duty to the people who established and elected its members to serve and represent them. The wheels of Parliament will continue to turn and no person will be allowed to disrupt parliamentary proceedings or to undermine the democratic mandate of parliament. When I ruled in January 2021 on the issue of which side constitutes majority and minority in parliament, the ruling was in favor of the majority group then. It was not an act of lawlessness as to cause constitutional crisis. When I ruled in the matter of the vacation of seats by Honorable Kennedy Ajapon, Honorable Henry Corti, and Honorable Sarah Ajua Safo, the question of the interpretation of the constitution was not raised. When my predecessor declared the formula seat vacant in 2020, applying the same provisions of Article 97, the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to interpret and enforce provisions of the Constitution was not invoked. Peace reigned in these instances, and nobody cried and ran to the Supreme Court under the guise of constitutional interpretation. If I may ask, is it a legal matter for the Supreme Court to decide 
as to which side of the house constitute the majority or minority. It is for good reason that justice is said to be blind. And further, that justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done in all cases. Not in only those cases to which some people appear to be sentimentally attached. Fellow Ghanaians, I respectfully call on the Supreme Court to apply the same swiftness with which the motion ex parte in the Eastern matter was granted to the case involving the president refusal to receive the Human Rights and Family Values Bill passed by Parliament, which has been pending before the same court for almost a year without being heard. Ladies and gentlemen, consistency is not just an ideal, but the foundation of life. The court cannot enjoin four members of parliament from serving their constituents for 12 weeks, but was very eager to deny the constituents of Asen North their representation because of the issue of allegiance. The court cannot deny the constituents of SAL the sanctity of representation for years. The court cannot even see that the Constitution itself permits a denial of representation within three months to the holding of a general election. It's in the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, the Parliament of Ghana shall commence sitting as by law prescribed from tomorrow, November 7th, 2024. I have earlier instructed the clerk to parliament to transmit the LGBTQ plus bill to the president for assent. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, I'm aware of the business the government wants to transact through parliament. And I'm willing to cooperate and collaborate with government. That's all, this, despite all that I have said, Ghana first. And all Ghanaians should bear the president, parliament, the judiciary, and all our leaders in prayer for the betterment of our people and country. With this, I thank you all for your attention. Assalamu alaikum. The Right Honourable Speaker of the Eighth Parliament with that address. May we please be seated. This is the speaker's press conference, and he will now take questions from members of the media. We will take them in tranches of four. Please, brevity is the name of the game. So you get up, you tell us your name, your media house, and then your question. In order for us to get as many questions in as possible, one man, one match it. And please, the preambles. Let's just use them. The director of media relations will assist in this particular endeavor. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my name is Ibrahim Al Hassan. I report for, for GH1 TV and Star Show. Okay, so one man, one question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want the clarity. Have you re instructed the clerk to resubmit? the Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill to the presidency, or you relating to the old instruction you gave, which was rejected during the transmission? My name is Kwame Minka, TVXYZ Power FM. 
My question is simple. So tomorrow as Parliament sits, uh, tell us exactly how the sitting arrangement would be. Because uh, what, what we've been hearing is that uh, the minority then uh, has its, its majority and would they remain as such or there will be a shift? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My name is Kweku Asante from Joy News and Joy FM. Mr. Speaker, during the proceedings in court, the Attorney General had cause to say that you had committed a crime by illegally procuring the services of Mesa Sorry in litigating those matters in the Supreme Court. Specifically, he puts out a letter that has been signed by the PPA CEO rejecting a sole source procurement that you wanted to do as regards to Mesa Sorry. Please, can you respond to the specifics and allegations that you had committed a crime in that regard? My name is Havila Kekele, Class FM. Right, Honorable Speaker, there have been several occasions where uh, members of parliament sometimes drew uh, disagreement with some of your rulings or pronouncements on the floor. You certain words at you. Uh, how do you feel about some of these things? Uh, Mr. Speaker, we will respectfully take a fifth one. We'll take a fifth one because of the brevity of the question so that we can get as many questions. Thank, in thank you very much. As uh, my name is Sir John Amensa, and I report for GBC Online. Just to reiterate the point earlier made by my colleague. Uh, speaker, as we speak today, the media, we are somehow confused. You address MP as a minority leader and a, uh, or a majority leader. You are told that, please, that's not my title. Or they'll just cut the line. Please, can you settle this debate for us? Who is the majority leader today in Parliament? <laughs> the right honorable speaker. These are very interesting questions. The first one is easy. It's a fresh instructions to the clerk to parliament to resubmit the bill to the president. I'll leave it at that. The second one, please, it's not part of the duties of a speaker to decide where an MP should sit in parliament. It's not my duty. That determination in Ghana's situation, in various parliaments, these things we are talking about, majority side, minority side, don't exist any longer. That's why in my ruling, I use the term old school. The British model, government opposition, benches, and a carpet in between them. And so, when you are shifting your political leaning, you have to cross that carpet to the other side. And that is why you have the term carpet crossing. Our parliament is not arranged in the form of government and opposition. And Ghana don't like the term opposition. So we decided to adopt the terms from the United States of America, majority and minority. So you can even sit anywhere. <laughs> but the numbers determine who is majority and who is minority. But in our parliament, the practice is for those who constitute majority to sit at the right side of the speaker, and those who constitute minority to sit at the left side of the speaker. That is because after independence in 1957, we adopted the Westminster system, which is practiced in the United Kingdom. But we changed that, even to the extent that the arrangement on the floor of the house 
is in a horse shoe. So it's not always the case that the people to the left side are all members of minority. That's not the case now. And there's good reason behind this. As in the textbooks, the determination, therefore, in our situation, as to who constitute majority or minority, is a question of numbers. As to where they sit, is the determination first of the political parties who influence who should lead the caucus or party wing in parliament. They, after various consultations, decide that these five people should occupy these positions in leadership. And so they are given the chairs in front. Then in consultation with them, the five leaders, they determine who should sit behind them. Because as a leader, you need somebody that you have trust, confidence in, who has the capacity, so that when you are in, in some difficulty, or you have a challenge, you can just lean over and listen to his or her whisper. So you have a say as to who sits behind you. The speaker is not involved in this one. The whips, particularly the chief whips, lead in trying to identify who should sit behind. And it also has to do with years of experience in the house and also the issue of gender and other professional backgrounds until you get to those who are at the back. Even though we don't sit on benches, we still use the term back benches. The speaker is not involved in this. After they have agreed on it, they then get in touch with the parliamentary service through the clerk, who will get his uh, uh, officer at the table, together with the marshal. And they will get the names, print them, and place them on the various tables as decided by the various caucuses. The speaker don't come in this. Please. How can you call speaker to come and decide where people should sit? <laughs> it's not part of my duties. Number three. <laughs> I will plead with you. Go and look at that letter. He's the attorney general. He did his service in parliament here. I was leader then, yes. when he was doing his service here. Yes. So I know him very well before he became <laughs> Attorney General. <laughs> Read that letter carefully. And that's one of the things they are missing. There's vast difference between parliament as an institution and the office of the speaker. The speaker is the party before the Supreme Court, not parliament. So as speaker, when the attorney general is taking a different position from my position, I should still contract him as my counsel. I will leave it at that. Once I'll meet the Attorney General, and I'll tell him my peace of mind. <laughs> On some legal issues and pronouncements he made at the Supreme Court. You know, Attorney Generals must be respected as learned. But it should not be part of what Obama referred to. Not me. It will not work. Number four. <laughs> I 
and for the terms they use against me. It's part of the hazards of the work. We do everything as leaders, not to bring up our youth, to believe that indecent, intemperate, insulting and offensive language is the way to go. But people interpret freedom of speech to mean that freedom of speech without responsibility. You can just use any words. But you know how offensive it is to you yourself or your parents when it's used against your father or mother. But for me, what I believe in is that you reap what you sow. That one, nobody can run away from it. I think the last question, I answered it. As to who is majority, who is minority, I may declare to all of you, it's not a function or duty of the speaker. Thank you very much, right honorable speaker. We will take the next tranche. I see Ahmed, um, the director of media relations is working to do that. Uh, Again, thank you very your much. name? My name is Ahmed Usman Halid, Imam Zakaria, Gurguruwe. No, no, I have to plead the constitution, please, uh, I'll bet mine. <laughs> yes, can you open uh, Article 1 or 2? I just want to quote what the Chief Justice read in Spoon Court in the absence. My name is Ahmed Osman Halid, Imam Zakaria Gurue. Oh, a freelance journalist, not from MPP headquarters, please. My school fees was paid by the speaker, so. <laughs> Council, Article 2. Yeah. I just want to read what the Chief Justice read in the absence of the speaker. I didn't want to paraphrase, I just want to. Read Article 2. She says this way One, a person who alleges, I'll leave all and come to surplus four, failure to obey or carry out the term of an order or direction made or given under the clause 2 of the article in this constitution commits a high crime. Under, under this constitution, and shall, in the case of the president or the vice president, constitute a ground for removal from office under this constitution. Right, Honorable Speaker, this was read before an open court, Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was saying that it has instructed you to adhere to its orders. Failure is that she's going to apply Article 2, Clause 4 on you. That even the President or the Vice President, if they go contrary, or if they, 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 they may refuse to, I mean, follow the order, they suffer this particular punishment. Right, Honorable Speaker, have you gone contrary? to the Supreme Court orders, ruling, or judgment. Thank you very much. OK, um, my name is Evans of uh, from TV, SYZ, and Power FM. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, we want to know whether the four seats which were declared uh, vacant still remain vacant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My name is Simon again. I report for the Accra Times. 
uh, in one of the interviews uh, former majority leader, Honorable Chair Mensa, had with Joy News, he said after your predecessor, former Speaker Michael K, give the ruling in 2020, he disagreed with former Speaker Michael K, and you supported his stance. I want to find out why did you go back to support your former predecessor when you express disagreement with his earlier ruling. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My name is George AC and I'm with Ghana Web. Um, by your ruling on the 17th, the four MPs were supposed to have vacated their seat and the court has ordered them to come back. What, what is your instruction to um, the clerk and those who are responsible? Are they going to be allowed to come in, into the parliament, into parliament or not? Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. My name is Nana Kweku Bufa, and I work with Opimso Radio in Menshia, Kumase. Speaker, you have been accused of uh, interpreting 1992 Constitution when you declare the four seat vacant. Um, speaker, I want to know, did you do so? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, uh, Director. I think we've taken the fifth, the fifth one. And so, uh, Mr. Speaker may um, answer the um, five questions with uh, Kwekubofa's own on whether he misinterpreted the provisions in the 1992 constitutions when he declared the four seats vacant. Mr. Speaker. Well, you're talking about the same matter using different words. But that is before the Supreme Court. And I've given instructions to my lawyers to handle that. So that is not a matter for me to comment on. My lawyers are handling that. So all questions were dealing with those issues before the court will allow the court to handle that. What I would draw your attention to is that the practice and procedure of parliament is unknown to many, including the court. And anything I do on the floor, I refer to the standing orders. The courts can declare the standing orders as unconstitutional or unlawful or whatever. Until that is done, as the presiding officer, I'm bound on issues of procedure, proceedings, and practice, apply those rules. And that is what we did. That is why in my statement, I drew your attention to the fact that what I did on the floor was just sharing of information, communicating to the members that this issue that was raised, and by the standing orders, I have options. Could have set up a committee to go and go through it and submit a report. That report could even lead to legislation. Or I could go and inquire into it myself, and then come and inform the House of my findings. That is in the standing orders. That is what I said is being construed to mean ruling. In our parliamentary practice, you don't make ruling when statements are made. Statements are commented upon. By the nature of the subject matter was debatable. And because of its importance, I had to give room for many more members to comment. By trying to comment, they debated it. So that was what happened. But I'm clear as to my rule. 
Just inquire into it. Come and share with the house in the form of information what your findings revealed. And that was all what I did. I did not make any order. Go and read the proceedings. I did not make any order. As for my friend, the veritable Honorable Oseche Mensa Bonsu, I'm sure he showed you the evidence where we had that discussion. <laughs> he disagreed, and I supported him. And now I have made a U-turn. I thought you should have asked him. When my predecessor made the ruling, whether his side disagreed with him and allowed the same member, who is now second deputy speaker, to continue to sit, or his seat was vacated. Did they agree with him or disagree with him? You should have asked him. So that one, he would need to produce evidence to show that this is what happened. I don't know where we sat and held the discussion, or it's on the floor, and the official reports are there for you to go and read, whether I got up and in my constitution disagreed with my predecessor. That is for you to, to make your findings on. And what's the last question? I answered all. Yes. And that's it. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. We'll take two more tranches and then we'll be done. Um, we're doing well so far. The Director of Media Relations is still going around with the microphones. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Um, you said the President and the Judiciary have seen against the... My name is Oyenian Ponce. I work with Adam FM and Adam TV. Now, you said the President and the Judiciary have seen against the Constitution. Would you tell us more on that? What would you say that will be the things or the acts they have done that will constitute, in your opinion, sin against the Constitution? Good afternoon, Right Honorable Speaker. My name is Nia Yukioka. I work for CTFM and Channel One TV. Now, Article 112, Clause 3 of the Constitution, as well as the Standing Orders 53, have been invoked by the NPP caucus for the third time this year. Uh, whenever you agend the House indefinitely. Now, we want to find out, is this an abuse of that provision and what has been its impact on other legislative processes? Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Akoli of PCFM. Speaker, a number of people have described this if parliament as very chaotic based on events that hap uh, which happened when this parliament came into being and what is happening currently. Mr. Speaker, how do you see this parliament? Are you proud of the eighth parliament? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. My name is Kwabna Efre Martin. Um, I report for Original TV and Original FM. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know what influenced your decision of a genuine parliament synodai the last time we had our sittings, and what will be your decision if the same situation which happened in the last sittings continue tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My name is Clement Akolo. I report for uh, Parliament News 360. I also double as the communication officer for Parliamentary Network Africa. Um, Mr. Speaker, you uh, mentioned that the, uh, both the president and the, um, the judiciary have sinned. And um, when you look at Article 122 of the Constitution, it talks about um, the contempt of Parliament. So if they have sinned, uh, do they fall far of uh, 
the contempt of parliament and what are you going to do about it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. I think that's the fifth question for this tranche. I get the feeling that this could be the last one. Am I right, colleagues? Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, with your kind permission, if you may answer the five questions that we referred to. The, the two, two of you raised a question about the sinning of the president and the judiciary. Please go through the Constitution or the laws of Ghana. There is nowhere where the president can refuse to receive a bill passed by parliament. In fact, the crafters of the Constitution are so careful that they even took away veto power from the president. So in Ghana, our president cannot veto a bill passed by parliament. It's clear in the Constitution that the president will receive the bill passed by parliament. If he has concerns, he will communicate to parliament that I have concerns on this bill that you have passed within seven days. Then he has 14 days to put across those concerns back to parliament. And parliament is called upon to reconsider the bill, taking his inputs into consideration. That is what is in the constitution and the laws of Ghana. So if the president refuses to even receive the bill, what has he done to the constitution? You understand? Two, in the constitution, the president is permitted to refer the bill to the council of state for advice. He didn't even do that. So the term I even used is very mild. <laughs> In the case of the judiciary, a bill is a bill. It's not law. It's just a bill. Uh, this is a draft that is being discussed. The judiciary is going to do what? Be part of the law making process. Tell us what to do in the bill. It's only when it's passed and assented to by the president, then it becomes law that the judiciary can come in to interpret and enforce. There's nothing like that. And this is something that immediately, with supersonic speed, it should have been jettisoned, not entertained at all by the court. Now what it means is that anytime any bill is before us, and we are working on it at this stage, anybody can just take it to the court. And that will mean that parliament will have to stop and wait until the final determination of what? What are they to determine? Please. We are doing this for Ghana and not for only today's generation. For generations yet unborn. We are building a durable, sustainable governance structure that gives certainty to everybody that is the rule of law that prevails, not of man, or the rule by law. The two are not the same. When you rule by law,
people are not certain of the law. And so even investors ran away. And as a leader for so many years, from 2001, I've been a leader. I can mention so many serious investors who say they will not invest in Ghana because of uncertainty of the law. Attempts to invest here, you definitely have branches with the law, and then the courts and the system cannot tell you what the law is. And they lose a lot. So when you talk about unemployment, underdevelopment, and the rest, now who calls them? Leadership, I believe strongly, is cause. Everything else is effect. Even though followers matter. Followers matter. And that is where, in fact, we applauded the efforts of the president. When in his inaugural speech, he talked about us being citizens and not what? Spectators. Today, Ghanaians are now more spectators than citizens. I think you have to wake up and become the citizens that he called us to be. That is where I'm moving towards. I don't have any ill will or malice, no. I don't have any ambition. If there's honorable bugbin or whatever people don't want, please, that one, I can assure you, I'll go and relax. And my holy village is always there to welcome me. I don't have any problem at all. But once I sit here, I take the decisions and I'm responsible. Nobody else but me. That's why I started with my oath. I swore the oath. <laughs> and at the end of the day, when I'm to account for my life to my creator, nobody is do that, to do that with me. I'll be alone. And I'll be there. Those of you who come later. <laughs> because I believe in life after death. In fact, we have you told that place better than here. So I have no problem with dying. I'm always prepared any time to die. And, but you will come after that. And <laughs> you will come and meet me there. <laughs> <laughs> eh? I will tell you what seniority means. <laughs> <laughs> the right honorable speaker shall live to tell of the good works of the recall, Lord. Hey, there's, there's one on there. Oh, okay. The, 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 I have the indications that there are some oh, two critical questions. So yeah, maybe I'll after finish, that, yes, then we that. can quickly go on. Oh, recall. I recall, I can't say it's an abuse. The constitution permits them to do what they do. It's just that. Please, don't only think about today. Also think about tomorrow when you are doing some of these things. And for me, as I sit here, I thought the focus of those in government shall be about government business, not even the position they occupy. Which is more important? It's government business. After the position you occupy, if you work well, you may even get a higher position. Yes, <laughs> eh? It's the good people of Ghana who will decide. So I'm surprised that some people are focused on that one. But tomorrow, you will hear from me. <laughs> we will take, we are bringing proceedings to a close, but I see Our that Our parliament oh. so far is transformatory. In fact, this is a parliament. I've been from the first to the eighth. The first was foundational. And the late Right Honorable Justice Daniel Annan had to use all his experience 
and wisdom to establish the parliament. And so he started by transforming the rules that we inherited from the 79 to 81 parliament, that's the Third Republic, and also putting the structures and personnel in place, creating the opportunity for further training, education, and the rest. He did that. The second parliament, led by Right Honorable the late Right Honorable Peter Lajete, focused on trying to strengthen uh, the second speaker, as you say. Second speaker, third parliament. To strengthen the institution of parliament. And you recall sometimes he had some rough edges with the president. No wonder he lasted for four years only. <laughs> and it established a four-year term for Speaker of Parliament. The fourth was trying to stabilize the fourth, uh, the third speaker. And that was Right Honorable Ebenezer Sechi Hughes. I worked with all of them. The fifth came, and that was our beautiful lady, Supreme Court Judge, Justice Edeline Bamford Ado. And she, with her experience from the bench, focused on the rules and dignity of the house. So you could see her dressing, her posture, her patience, and everything mattered to the institution. Then, the next speaker, that was my brother, very good friend of mine, who was my chief whip, became my deputy leader when I was the leader, later on became first deputy speaker and became speaker. So he used his experience in the house and his connection with members, particularly their dealings at the Parliamentary Service Board, to initiate a lot of things. And then our professor came. who in 1990 to take us on issue in the of Ghana, the political science department. So we studied together. I knew him long before he came. And I happened to be the second deputy speaker to him. So I have all that record and all the happenings in the house. And I saw how we struggled to change the rules of the game. But before I became speaker, the voters changed the rules. And so you now don't have a majority where you can just sit down and just put the question. And you are sure the eyes have it. And so most attack, there is no day that I will go and preside without calling the leaders to my lobby for us to go through the agenda of the day, which is usually captured on what? The order paper, yellow. This is what is on the paper cut from the business statement. How do we handle it? Then the leaders will tell me, those that they agree, those that they disagree, even when they disagree, how do we handle it? We discuss all that. Okay, how many from each side of the house? We discuss that. How many minutes per person? We discuss that. Then I just come to preside and enforce what we have discussed. That is why it's difficult for us to be sitting at 10. Because sometimes I have to get them to make sure that there's some peace before we go out there. This is what we do on a daily basis. I just don't come and preside and impose my ideas. Even when you go to voting, we agree. 
we will oppose. If you give eyes during the voice vote, we will challenge your decision. We will count hairs. We will do secret voting. We will not allow public voting. We discuss all this. And so even so, the discussion at that period, when people, leaders go on air and go and reveal those conclave confidential information, what is that meant to, be, to achieve? I should not invite them to discuss things with them again. And what will happen on the floor? In spite of all that, for four good years, four good years, people are still not appreciative. And I am the target. Hey, this is my God. Hey. <laughs> it's a living God, though. <laughs> so please. Mr. Speaker, we, we are live on uh, GH1, GBC. Oh, you are live. And uh, we, we, we <laughs> I, I, would, I would crave your indulgence that um, we take, uh, I've seen some crucial questions that I think must be asked so that we can round up, so that they don't search out just for spending too much of their live air time. And so we'll take the final tranche of questions and then uh, we, will, we will bring proceedings to a close. Very quickly, name, media house, question. No preamble. And Thank you very much. My name is Ernest Kofiedu. I work with the Delhi Guide newspaper. Right now, speaker, at the last agenda date, you said that because of the issue of composition and that of the fact that parliament had the current number to do business, but they had the current number to undertake the decision. You are recalling the house tomorrow. Can you tell us whether these issues have been addressed and whether there has been meeting between yourself and the leadership of the house said that tomorrow's recall will also not degenerate into that confusion. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, good afternoon. My name is Brian Sassari from Penn TV. Um, in your speech, you just said that um, you expressed concern about the fact that members of the house now um, are resorting to the Supreme Court to deal with conflicts that happen in the house. And you believe that that wouldn't help. Now we're having a conflict now. And I want to know that um, how do we handle this conflict resolution process and who is to initiate it? Because you said you have been doing this for many years. So how can we come together and solve this impasse? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Isaac Ando, a freelance journalist. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In your speech, you indicated that the matter before the Supreme Court could have been handled internally through dialogue and compromises. Uh, please, is it too late? We are rounding up. Is that, um, ha have we satisfied you now from this corner? Okay, I think um, we can... No, Jara. No, Jara. I think we can... Uh, successfully bring proceedings to a close with Mr. Speaker answering these questions. But I must also indicate that, Mr. Speaker, that TV3, 3FM, Joy FM, they are all broadcasting live. In fact, I have received City FM, GH1, TV, I don't know, I think, is it TV? They are all live. So, um, we, today has been one of the days that we've had the most live coverage, and we're grateful to you before the deputy comes to say thank you. Just to let you know that we are live on all these channels and on our own channels as well. I'm extremely, extremely grateful to the media for this coverage. That is what is expected of the media. And truly, for these 32 years, without the media, we wouldn't have gone this far. So, congratulations. We always disagree. But once we have agreed to disagree, 
as part of our life. It's permitted. There's no problem with that. Please, ask what will happen tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Because I don't control that. But you know, what happened? The day of the adjournment. I don't see the young man again. Oh, you are the one standing up there. Yes, yes, yes. You know, as I told my friends, on the MPP side, I had three options. After you walked out, and was only left with the NDC members. Accra proceeded with the business. Would they have been approved by, by, by the NDC MPs for government? Even if they did, would they not go and raise an issue about quorum to take decision? So that was not a legally accepted option. I would have decided to adjourn till the next day. By knowing the nature of the disagreement, would it have been solved within one night? Because I've seen that the nature of the disagreement goes beyond the house to the powers outside the house. And so we needed to engage many more people to be able to resolve the disagreement. So you need more time. And since I have estimated the time, I decided that it should be what? Indefinite. After we resolved that, then Parliament could be recalled. If people were that there's some agency for us to resolve it, they would have come together faster for us to talk, negotiate things, resolve it, and come back. But I tell you, apart from some senior citizens, patriots of the country, who actually got in touch with me, the leadership of the MPP members have not gotten in touch with me. They haven't. My good friend, Osei Che Mensa Bonsu, spoke to me. Because he wasn't even around when this thing happened. And we discussed this thing. I threw more light on it. And he said, oh, he didn't know before granting interviews. He said those things. But now he can also say, I should bring my <laughs> official report. You know? <laughs> so, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of the resolution of the disagreement. And so I don't know what will happen tomorrow. But I'll be available to preside. You understand? And so that is the situation now. Uh, the last question. Proposal. Proposal. Well, am I now to propose it to you and Ghanaians? Or I should I be making the proposals to the parties so that they can be negotiating and compromising? I think that's the best way to do. And I'm expecting that, like the, in fact, I need to praise some leaders because the first to get in touch with me, I think, was Apostle Nyamiche and the, the boss of the Christ Apostolic Church. They were the first to come to express concern and had a lengthy discussion. You know. Then later, uh, the, a delegation of the Council of State also came to meet me in the office. And when I explained all the situation to them, in fact, many of them were really surprised because what they heard on air and what I told them and said they could cross-check 
from the proceedings or other things. They were really surprised, but they didn't know that was what took place. There was so much misinformation and all those, and I don't want to go into those details because they are before the court. At the end of the day, the judgment of the court will set a lot of precedents. But don't forget, the law is that the Supreme Court can always differ from its earlier decision. That is a danger. So for a purpose, I can give a judgment and ruling to favor the situation. Tomorrow, I say, ah, no, 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 no. No, I disagree with that. And that is permitted by law. So when you tell me that it means that the Supreme Court is supreme, and so when it orders, I must obey. Ah. <laughs> when I know the same Supreme Court can disorder, you have to raise a question back. I'm a lawyer by profession. And I, the first time I appeared in the Supreme Court was 1983. 1983. That was my first case in the Supreme Court. I don't know whether those who are going there now were born, <laughs> but uh, it's okay. The last one is uh, when I was young, I think when we were in the senior high, we were not calling it senior high, we were calling it secondary school. There was some song, it's too late, too late to say that you are sorry. <laughs> After you broke in my poor heart. <laughs> when I needed you, needed you to satisfy my soul. <laughs> you turn your back and say, Now, I think we should add singer to Mr. Speaker's <laughs> because uh, the skills keep adding as, as we go along. I, I said he was an old woman in an old man's skin. He, he refused, but... Mm. And so um, I think that uh, you'd all agree with me that we've had a very fruitful good afternoon.